Well, hello and welcome to today's Form by Content talk, Colonialism and its Narratives, presented by two of Australia's leading artists, Judy Watson and Helen Johnson, and convened today for us by Tina Baum. Form by Content is an annual lecture series presented by Monash Art, Design and Architecture and programmed by Monash University Museum of Art. Um, we started doing the series online in 2020, obviously in response to the fact that we couldn't gather. We're really pleased to present this talk in person today and moving forward next year, the talks will all be on campus and in person. So um, we're really delighted to have you here for this event today. Uh, my name's Kate Barber. I work here in public programs at MUMA and before I introduce today's discussion and our esteemed guest speakers, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners and elders, past, present and emerging, of the lands on which Monash University is sited and operates. And I acknowledge Aboriginal connection to material and creative practices on these lands for over 60,000 years, and also that sovereignty was never ceded. I'd now like to extend a very warm welcome to our guests today. Um, it's been really delightful this week to have um, Tina and Judy in the galleries and Helen also, although I missed you on the day you were here, and um, really wonderful to have guests visiting us and spending time in the museum. So without uh, any further ado, uh, Judy Watson is a one year woman based on Jagara, Yugara and Turrbal country of Mianjin, Brisbane. Judy did give me some tips um, on the pronunciation yesterday. Uh, Helen Johnson is a second generation immigrant of Anglo descent based in Wanjura, Waimurung country here in Nam, otherwise known as Melbourne. We're also joined by Tina Baum and Tina is from the Gulmigan, Ladakai, uh, Wandaman, Garajari peoples of the Northern Territory in Western Australia. And Tina is curator, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander art at the National Gallery of Art in Canberra. And for this exhibition, Judy and Helen have each developed um, quite a distinctive iteration uh, to the exhibition that was presented previously in Canberra. And under Hannah Matthews, our senior curator's um, guidance and in conversation with her, they have brought in some older existing works as well as, well as new works that really um, kind of extend this exhibition. And we're really just so proud to be presenting the Red Thread of History Loose Ends here at MUMMA. It will officially open on Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday, the 10th of September, with the opening celebrations from 3 to 5 p.m., and we do extend a warm welcome to all of you to attend that uh, particular event. There'll be a really wonderful catalogue available and other publications by both of the artists. Uh, so for this exhibition, as I mentioned, both uh, Judy and Helen have really explored the significance of family and motherhood, the particular importance of matrilineal lineage, and the tensions between individualism and connectedness. In conversation with Tina today, They'll discuss their individual and ancestral cultural experiences of living in Australia and how they're reflected in their practices and working mythologies, methodology. Sorry. Judy Watson and Helen Johnson, The Red Thread of History, Loose Ends, is an opportunity to experience the work of two of Australia's leading artists in an exhibition that explores complex and varied perspectives on colonialism with an emphasis on the experience of women. The exhibition was originally commissioned by the National Gallery of Australia for the Know My Name program and as a part of the Balnaves Contemporary Series. So as I said, we're just so delighted to have it here on campus at MUMMA. I'm looking forward to the exhibition launching on Saturday. Um, for those of you who might have to duck away and leave back to class, there is a really remarkable uh, poster that you're very welcome to take with you and we hope that you'll join us on Saturday for the opening celebrations. Now over to Tina, Judy and Helen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Kate. I also just wanted to just add to the acknowledgements and I always do um, as a, I suppose, a generational uh, person from it. The, uh, I also acknowledge the stolen generations and their families and recognise their ongoing journeys of recognition and reconnection. So thank you for that, Kate. Um, 
what can I say, let's get these two talking. Um, I'm the kind of uh, ring in with all of this, so I'm really pleased to be here with Helen and Judy today. Um, I wanted to start from the beginning because the, the background's been given already for it. Um, neither of you had really worked professionally together prior to this uh, coming together for this commission um, project. And for those who, who may not know, um, Helen came on board first for the Balnaves commissioning project and then Judy, um, and I think it was at your, your suggestion that um, you know, when we were looking at a, a, an Aboriginal uh, female artist to, to come on board, um, Helen certainly suggested Judy and, um, and as you'll see come Saturday, it's a really quite a beautiful um, partnering there. But I wanted to ask, um, can you talk about your, your um, pairing for this exhibition? Um, and what it's meant to you both, um, professionally and personally, um, but also um, because your, your coming together um, began before the, the finalisation of your works, whether or not it, um, your, I suppose, friendship, um, if I can say that, yeah, um, had any, you know, flow-on effect to the works that you created in the end for the project. You start. Okay, um, I, I also want to just start by acknowledging that we're on Wurundjeri country here and that I was born and raised on Wurundjeri Wurundjeri country, sovereignty never ceded. Um, I, I guess I was first interested in bringing my work into a conversation alongside Judy's because I've seen, I've always been interested in the way that our works have these material similarities on, on some levels in terms of um, both of us often working unstretched and often working at large scales, um, often doing stuff that's floor based and comes into existence on the floor. Um, sometimes out of practical necessity for me, but um, that also uses like a lot of techniques that come out of printmaking, um, embossing and pushing and taking paint off surfaces with different textures and things like that. Um, but then the, the outcomes of those works are so different because in them, in here is our really different experiences of the world, our different subject positions as women. Um, but alongside that, um, I have a beautiful memory of um, having one of the first um, kind of extended conversations I had with Judy um, was at a dinner we both ended up at um, when I was a few months pregnant and feeling quite um, like alone in that and not knowing anyone else who was pregnant at the time and not knowing what that experience was going to be of childbirth and stuff and Judy was um, just so generously sharing with me experiences of the beauty of that but also like the things that go AWOL and the shitty nappies and <laughs> you know all of that aspect of it too. So I guess those were the points of connection for me. And it was a bit of a, it was a bit of a weird process, the making of this show because of COVID lockdowns, really restricting travel for the time when we were producing the works. Um, so we didn't get to physically be in each other's studios. We met up in person a few times when we were able and looked at different works together. Um, we went through the Tiwi Islands show together at the NGV, which was a really beautiful experience. Um, and I think you've said this before, Judy, it's a really nice way to connect actually, looking at other artworks and seeing, you, you learn someone's lens. Um, and also through that situation of the restrictions of that time, um, Judy really, um, I really learnt a lot from Judy about 
generosity and sharing and you know she was always sharing her thoughts and images even when they were just an inkling and you know I was like neurotically like oh I have to finish this thing before I let it into the world and I think I learned from Judy the, the value of just relaxing with that and letting things flow and letting letting connections form as they you know as they want to I also want to acknowledge um, traditional owners of this country and the fact that we're all on Aboriginal land now as an Awani woman. And everyone who's here, uh, Aboriginal Torres Strait Island people and all of you and your families. Yeah, it's true in some ways that I would take photos of things, but I don't know that I was relaxed about it. <laughs> I, I was uh, playing around and wasn't sure what I was doing really. I sort of knew that I wanted to explore histories and women and various things, but I feel like each project I tend to lurch towards and into and then out of and onto the next. So the most pleasurable thing is actually making the work and then that's only a very small fraction of it. A lot of the time it's processing it all, working out where it goes and that's where it was good having Tina and Jacqueline Bovington that we were also talking about uh, what was happening because we were all in different places. None of us really knew, or maybe you did, I don't know. <laughs> um, and I think I agree it was good to meet up uh, in Melbourne and then in Sydney again and have a look at work together, talk about things and like, Hopefully that's not me. <laughs> um, I think for all of you, I would just say, while you've got your colleagues here, hold on to them if you can, um, and really go around and look at work together, speak about work, talk about it, and also use them to bounce off ideas about, and also just to check on things. It might be, oh, is this a really dodgy situation, or how do I do this? because that's what we all do, and I do it now with Helen too. We just talk about all sorts of things, and it's, you know, some somebody who's safe that you can sort of connect with, and there's no ego involved. It's just a sharing of experiences and a fact-checking and what would you do in this situation? So sort out, you know, who's good like that for you and um, make sure you grab them. And that, that takes me on beautifully to my next question, which is about the title, um, you know, the and how you both separately but also collectively came together to to settle on it. I think it's a really interesting story that, um, that the audience might be interested in um, because I think it came from your research and also your separate research as well. So can you share a bit more about how you both settled upon the title? Uh, so there's... Ernest Reshner talks about the red thread of history uh, being ochre, which connects all of us and our cultures. So it's at the beginning of every culture, everywhere in civilization within the world, or at the end of it. Whether it's at the birth, whether it's at the death, whether it's at celebration, art, etc. And I've always thought that's an incredible thing because ochre, I'm very drawn to it within both Australia, but also countries overseas. And I often travel, um, you know, I've been to certain places and looked at okra or found it and very interested in it because it's, well, it's got many properties. Sometimes it's seen as having transformative properties. It's something which is used for painting up. It's something which is used medicinally. And it's been, you know, a really important resource that's traveling all across Australia. Um, and other places in the world. So people have sourced ochre, as you probably know, from remote sites in WA or in South Australia, etc. Different colours, different pigments, different properties, and travelled with them. You might know about the ochre men, for example, holding um, ochre on their heads and travelling like a snaking serpentine line, going through the Flinders Ranges and, and across. And it has so much significance and so that's the red thread of history but I was also telling Helen about the um, crimson thread and something that I read about Henry Parks 
uh, and we were travelling through um, parks and here was this monument and it had this quote and he talked about the crimson thread uh, like a, a bloodline but it was not about uh, people of colour, it was about people who were Anglo, white, you know, sort of all the... I'll let you talk about Sure, yeah, so I kind of followed up that, um, went monument hunting and, you know, there's many monuments to Henry Park, and including name of the suburb in which the NGA is situated. Um, and, yeah, just dug around um, and learned a bit about his role in Federation, which he was a... Um, a big voice in the process of so-called Australia becoming federated. Um, and he actually appears in one of my paintings in this show from a cartoon around that time, along with a lot of imagery that um, at the time of its making was popular and widely known, but has since been uh, swept under the rug or, you know, gotten um, tucked away in the archives um, in favour of, you know, this... I feel like we sort of, um, as a colonial society, curate these um, versions of history that, that try and propose colonial society as something OK, you know, but then there's all this information that, you know, reveals the foundations of it very clearly, the racism and the violence of it very clearly. Um, and that's, that's a lot of what, um, what drives me to make work that addresses those histories, is to bring some of those things that have been swept under the rug back into... Um, this up at this bodily scale and back into visibility um, just as a way to, to say, you know, these attitudes might have changed form but they haven't gone anywhere, actually. Yeah. And I guess there's, um, there's quite a lot of ochre in your works in the show too, Judy, in some of the prints and some of the string. Yeah, no, thank you. One of the core premises behind the exhibition is the role that women have played in this nation, so from First Nations to, to you know, from colonial days through to today. Um, each of you have featured um, the women or family members in your works. Can you share a bit more about how or why that was important to include uh, the women, uh, your family particularly, in your works? Well, I think we had spoken about, you know, sort of the connections that we have. And so, both being women, mothers, living in Australia, making work, um, trawling through documents, archives, uh, and referencing, you know, histories of colonisation, uh, among other things. And so, I decided to do uh, the silhouettes of my mother, one of my sisters, my daughter, uh, and one of my cousins, and then uh, one of my art assistants, Ebony, whose family's from Sri Lanka. Just sort of thinking about those connections and, and disconnections that we have. But some of the um, silhouettes are placed over maps of country, and the maps have got property stations and the stations are many that my family, my Aboriginal matrilineal family worked on, lived on, uh, were born on. And there's, you know, another work petition where uh, the station owners, managers um, signed a petition saying that they didn't want Aboriginal people in that area to be paid. Uh, they wanted to get some nice young white boys in instead and basically sort of, you know, trying to... Um, depopulate the area of Aboriginal people and, you know, not pay them a decent wage, among other things. So, once again, a lot of those places are properties that are um, within my blood memory through my family of places that they worked on. Um, 
I, I think I, I think about a lot of the work in this show in terms of transmissions, um, both the things that get transmitted through history um, that form cultures, um, and also on the on the familial level, um, there's one of my paintings that I made thinking about my sisters. I have four older sisters and another that contains the mouths of my studio assistants. Um, this was something that we, one of the first things we spoke about was like, right, let's make sure your assistants and my assistants are getting paid equally for this project, <laughs> that there's equity. Um, but um, yeah, they, they play a really important role in in my daily life when I'm in the studio, the conversations that we have and the way that um, thoughts get um, shared, I suppose. And I also, that painting also includes the mouth of my four-year-old daughter. And I think a lot about transmission of ideas in relation to her and how to give her an awareness of what it means to be part of a colonising society, but in a way that gives her the humility to want to learn and reflect and listen and understand, rather than feel, hmm, I don't know what that is. It sounds like a, <laughs> sounds like a, someone blowing their nose. Um, yeah, rather than um, rather than become defensive or um, you know run up against your own ignorance or um, end up taking a an attitude towards that position that feels like where you feel threatened by it because your power your position of power is being brought into question or you're trying to bring it into question yourself constantly. Um, yeah, and I feel like that that feels like a promising and positive thing to me compared to my understanding of those realities when I was growing up in the outer suburbs of Melbourne to, with British parents who didn't know much about those histories either. Um, but the other day I was, I picked my daughter up from kinder and she said to me, do you know what it is, mum? It's poor neat. And we, we just, the tadpole season just started and I was like, that's nice. She knows, mm -hmm. she's, she's getting that knowledge, appreciating where she is. Fantastic, thank you. Judy, this is a question for you. Your works are, you know, you've just visually stunning storyboards that, ex that explore truth-telling, really. There's some hard stories that are in some of the works that you have there from, you know, the frontier violence to, to contemporary issues today of, you know, deaths in custody. Can you just share briefly um, why it was important to, you know, not just have those, um, you know, the colonial stories and that, but also those, um, you know, some really, really hard stories that you have in your works, even though people may look at them and think, wow, these are, you know, the, the stories that, that lie within them uh, are not so evident, but can you share um, why those particular stories um, have been important in your practice? Uh, yeah, I mean, it comes and goes. Sometimes some of my work doesn't always have those embedded stories, but when they do, it's for a particular reason. So, for example, the Skullduggery work, which was actually made prior, but I thought was important to be in in the show was some um, documents that I'd heard about and a story I'd heard about which is based around um, the Gulf Country in which this Aboriginal man, King Tiger, and you'll, if you look at the video, you'll, you'll see the story and hear um, the various Aboriginal voice performers reading it out. So they're reading the white words in which um, his remains were and his his skull and his breastplate were dug up, uh, given to the matron of Burketown Hospital. He's King Tiger, King of Lawn Hill Mines, which is around our country. 
and the the Birktown matron, um, Agnes Kerr, decided that she would wanted to send it off to the Welcome Museum in London. And this correspondence went back and forth. And this was in the 1930s, not that long ago. So there's a lot of stories like that. Gay Sculthorpe, a Tasmanian Aboriginal curator who I had met when I worked on the Bunjalaka project, Warwicka, etch sink wall at the Melbourne Museum, forward me the correspondence. And when somebody does that, I feel like I have an, the responsibility to do something with it. So that's where it, it came from, really. Um, so that that's a story that I think um, it's just one story, but it sort of um, brings up many stories about ancestral remains um, being sort of, you know, shunted around between museums, collections, uh, used as trophies. You know, it's an ongoing thing for Indigenous people around the world. And so that's where that came from. And the deaths in custody uh, work Veil of Tears. Um, it shows only a very, very small proportion of deaths in custody, the ones that families have allowed the Guardian newspaper to collect and to publish. And so it's once again just a, a very small inkling of what lies beneath. And I was talking with um, John the sign maker today about it and saying this is something where you have these muslin lengths where um, friends and colleagues and families sew scars or welt wounds onto them and you get the shadows coming through onto those documented you know, sort of lines of text. But it could be many other things. It could also be um, the parallel histories of um, many people who are unrecorded as having died through COVID. And there might be many families that you know of who have had that happen to them. Um, you know, suicide. There are so many different stories which affect people and not everybody knows, but it's like that idea of hidden histories and uh, thinking about the psychic or the memory scars which we and families, you know, carry within us. Thanks. Likewise, Helen, your, you know, um, major works, you know, the, the, the large works that are in, in the exhibition um, also, you know, talk about that, that colonial experience and the, you know, the birth of a nation and, and the forming of a nation and um, from a, you know, uh, a Western perspective as well. Um, can you briefly talk about, you know, one in particular that's really resonated with you? Um, I mean, there's probably many, um, but, um, um, you know, a, a work, say, like Birth of an um, Institution um, that um, you, you'd like to share a bit on? Sure. Um, the work Birth of an Institution started with the blueprint of the State Library of Victoria, and it I wasn't um, aiming to make an address to, to that specific building um, so much as that being one of the buildings that um, I was thinking of it as like the colony getting its eye teeth or something, like when those big colonial buildings started being built um, in the Port Phillip district. Um, but I... Um, when I've previously made works um, drawing on those histories and those archives, I've often um, ended up focusing on male imagery and the, the male energy of the um, division of land and the control and, you know, all of it. Um, but with this body of work, I have um, became interested in the role of women um, in those situations and, um, you know, looking at all this imagery from the moment of Federation where the newly federated Australia was depicted as a young woman, this sort of young bride or something. Um, and uh, in the birth of an institution, I created this kind of scene where the blueprint of that library has been um, distorted into this fluid kind of destabilised form and uh, it sort of cuts through the body of a woman in labour who's um, about to push out. Um, instead of a baby's head, there's like the, the dome of that building, the, the Redmond Barry <laughs> reading room, um, sort of emerging from her body. So it's, and it's a big monster of a painting 
Um, so it's pretty full on. Um, and around her are all these kind of stakeholders witnessing this birth. It's like the, the father, banker, the priest, the policeman, the teacher, all of the, um, you know, the figures who were the beneficiaries and actors in the colonising process um, at, that, at that time. Um, so, yeah, I guess just um, asking the question, like, when we look at those histories, what happens when we put women at the centre of it? Does it? How does it change our thinking about it and our perspective and, you know, thinking about what that role was, you know, women were instrumentalised in many ways, but were also complicit in many ways. Um. Thank you. Um, just to both of you again, and to Hannah in the corner over there as well, um, under Hannah's vision, of course, with the exhibition, there's been additional works added in, in the show, uh, which have been really fantastic to see, you know, some of the early works and some new works. Um, I wanted to um, ask um, Hannah as well, um, as part of that, you know, I mean, contextualising um, these, these two incredible artists in this show, uh, <laughs> it can go one up. Um, it, it's been great for me, you know, um, seeing these earlier works, but also each of the artists have also spoken about, um, you know, not seeing a number of these works for a very long time. Um, can you just share really briefly just, um, or, or not, um, you know, because there's a lot, there's some fantastic works there. Um, you know, um, how important was it to include those additional works into the show as well? Um, sure. Um, I guess after going up to Canberra and seeing the project at the NGA um, and having conversations actually because you're both there at the same time and I guess picking up on where I found the joy that you're both taking in the conversations um, in terms of family, in terms of motherhood, um, and definitely in terms of, you know, the importance and influence of matrilineal lineages, which is sort of something we've been thinking about a bit, you know, more at Mama over the last two years. Um, I really heard that and encouraged both artists to share works that they sort of felt reflected back to that time of making their own families and how they thought of their own families and the different forms and languages that were used around that. Um, and I think, you know, picking up on what Helen said, Judy is an incredibly generous in her conversations and sharing of uh, both knowledge and artworks and other people's works and conversations. Um, and Helen similarly. So it was really through the works that both artists kind of brought. And I think when thinking quite personally about those connections and their importance and significance to them, um, that those additions to the exhibition have been made. And yeah, I mean, there are works that are made while being pregnant or expecting, you know, motherhood to arrive. Um, there's a relationships, yes, between, you know, sort of blood family, siblings. There's different notions of families as they might exist, you know, across community, but also maybe in social kind of spheres instead. So I think there's a sort of uh, diversifying of this notion of what constitutes family within the exhibition. Um, but I guess a real focusing on whatever that notion is, the importance of connection. Is that enough? Yeah, no, that was fantastic. Um, because, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the works, you know, you know, go across identity, you know, the, like you said, you know, country, community, um, what that sense is and, and from a, you know, a woman's perspective and that. But um, I think one of the last questions before um, we can open it to the floor is, you know, um, and this including for you as well, Hannah, um, as, as all mothers up here as well, you know, you, both your works are really inspirational to so many people and, and uh, play a really important role in well, what I think of as the, you know, the, the truth telling of, of this country. Um, can we ask just what inspires you? Um, you know, besides your family and community and that, um, what drives you to, um, you know, create the works that you do? 
and you know in this exhibition as well as you know your your future projections as well oh, paying the bills <laughs> that's critical yes no project to project uh, in this case it's yeah it's stories stories of my family um, you know, my mum does artwork with me. Um, my daughter's very strong in my life, as is my, my son too. But um, I loved doing projects where we were sewing together with colleagues and friends as well, but also making string together, going back to country. Back, going back to country is so important to me. Or, or going out into the bush or anything like that, I always feel just really replenished and, and being there and sharing it with them is great. Uh, I was just thinking of the, the profile of Rani, who's on the, the poster, my daughter, and the, the freshwater mussel shells known as uh, malu malu uh, in our country. And when you see those middens of these big freshwater mussel shells, you know that's a really important site. You know, all the women who would have dug them up with their toes and the side of the, um, you know, sort of the banks um, and harvested them, and in fact, it was so important in that area. It was known as water beef, you know, like it was such a staple um, diet. But it's also a very vaginal sort of shape, a very female shape, and the striations, or sort of going down through it, are also referencing a lot of the engraved tool marks on carved wooden vessels in our country too. So I think family. Um, but also culture, country, and history and contemporary events are what drive me to make something. And I know that by processing it as an artist, it's like you take it through your body, you push it through, and you feel a lot better for it. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. I think, um, I think when you make artwork or when you create anything you are, it gives you like a different relation to your subjecthood and enables you to understand your position in the world in a different way and in ways that are sometimes uncomfortable. Like sometimes I'll make a work and then put it up or put it out into the world and go, oh, I just realised what I was doing you know, didn't know what I was doing, just following an intuition, but then it sort of comes comes around and slaps you in the face and shows you that your unconscious is fully active. Um, and I think that's one of the things that, that drives me. Um, and I've, I've been thinking about it a lot lately because I've been training as an art therapist and, and working in a psychiatric unit in a public hospital. and. Um, thinking about the importance of having my own art practice in order to understand what it means to hold space for other people to explore through art materials, explore their own situations, um, and just having that sense of being able to... Um, being able to recognise in those situations what you're bringing and, and what they're bringing. And the, you know, these different things that can sometimes be hard to discern when there's all these different energies flying around the room. So that's something that's that's been really big for me lately in terms of driving my practice and feeding back into it as well. Thank you. Talking about holding space and as, as a slight shift as a curator, um, I know um, with myself and, you know, when I certainly when I deal with or, or look at um, works that... Um, I can certainly relate to, say, for example, with Judy's works and that, where I have to process works in my own um, setting as an Aboriginal woman, um, which can be really quite upsetting and, and, you know, you deal with that too. But for you as a curator, when you're, you're creating a space um, for, you know, artists like Judy and Helen, you know, what drives you or inspires you in your role? Yeah, it's a good question. Um... I think as a curator, it's really the learning that can be done with artists and through the work of artists. I think that's a really key thing, especially in a university art museum context. You know, the multitude of perspectives, experiences, knowledges that artists are so generous in sharing through their work. So that's a really key one. 
Um, and I think more specifically in the context of Helen and Judy and, and this project, um, you know, there is motherhood in terms of becoming a mother, but mother, mothering is not an exclusive event, right? Everyone has a relationship, good or bad, to a mother. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in the kind of intergenerational context of, um, you know, the, the roles, relationships of mothers across time and through um, history. And, um, you know, reading recently, just thinking about, you know, in the instance where one is becoming a mother, having children, the love kind of going forward, but it's equally inactive, reflecting back to one's relationship with one's own mother, and obviously those that come before, and I think that's a really important, um, it's something we've particularly been con conscious of here, actually, just, just how it threads through time, and um, it's a really kind of com complex relationship, and, um, you know, not an exclusive one, but just the various... Um, yeah, re relationships and knowledge, just how kind of key that relationship can be. Yeah, no, thank you. And, and the backbone that women are to this country, for sure. So um, we might open it up for any questions for from the audiences. Um, and we get a mic. Oh. Thank you, Kristen, over there. Hello, um, this is a question for you, Helen. Hearing you discuss art therapy and how your own art practice flows into your art therapy practice and helps you better understand patients' process and making, I'd be curious to hear more about how your art therapy practice flows back into your fine art practice and whether it's helped you appreciate connecting with your own unconscious and intuition in your own making? Thanks for the question. Um, I found that um, when I first started studying, um, which was, I, I got into the art therapy course the same day I found out I was pregnant actually, so it's been a long process. Um, but when I first started studying, I found that when we did experiential exercises in class, it was very, the stuff that was coming out bore no resemblance to my art practice, my studio practice, and I, was, I quite liked that. Um, but the, as the years have gone by, they've become closer and closer. Um, and actually, the book that Mum are publishing, hopefully there'll be some copies of this week, um, is a book of oil pastel drawings I did as, that was set as an art therapy assignment. They were like, we want you to keep a visual journal and just do something in it every day. Um, and that book ended up mapping my pregnancy and you can, I can see when I flick through it, this sort of, um, sorry, I don't know why that's happening. Um, this sort of transition from being a, being a subject to being like an incubator and giving over your subjecthood to another person and then coming back to being a subject once the, the baby came out. Um, but also more recently, because I, when I run groups on the psychiatric ward, I participate, I make art alongside the patients and um, a lot of those artworks that I've made in that setting have then ended up becoming like actually the only source material I've been using in the studio this past year, um, I've really sort of made this quite big shift to not using externally produced source material, just using things that have flowed out of my own unconscious, often in that setting, among other people, and so often made in this situation where you're sitting around a table and it's like a really social situation, which is quite different from the way that I would previously make um, or like conceptualise a work where it's just me sitting trawling through images on a computer or working in Photoshop or whatever. Um, so it's the more recent works of mine that are in this show are um, indicators of that shift and I feel like it's been really nourishing actually. I feel like it's um, that work feels very um, honest and direct and from
from the heart for me, um, which is it's quite a different experience from making work that draws on an archive that's a public archive and it's like I'm taking responsibility for this these these images and the modes of their making um, and resituating them in a way that um, you know is always there's always going to be like questions over that and and the decisions you've made and stuff um, as as well there should be um, whereas these works feel like they don't they're, they're more directly engaging with this, you know, the immediacy of being in the world, I suppose. Yeah. Sorry, that was a long, <laughs> long answer. Any other questions? Come on, must be one. I'd like to ask, um, when your work is shown in uh, public collections, particularly overseas, like Judy's in Paris and London, there's a, and the average person takes 30 seconds to look at a painting. Does it worry you that the average person has no idea of all the intricacies and histories and they just look at them as um, um, a decorative work, some of them, and they have no idea of the history behind all the work? control that. Uh, Helen's work and my work is both in the um, included in the Tate Modern uh, exhibition at the moment and I think for Australian audiences who come through and see like that group exhibition and see what's on they'll probably know and relate to a lot of things. I don't know if um, the other people who haven't been exposed to those histories what they'll make of it. Uh, they might read up about it, they might want to know about it, but you can't sort of like slap people around and force them to look at something and learn more about it, but you can seduce them. <laughs> so that's what I like to do, seduce them into being drawn into the work and then they might start finding out more and more about it and before they know they've swallowed that story and they can't get it out again. I would just say, in addition to that, um, you know, many artists, including First Nations artists, also, you know, sort of more use language, so the titling conventions for their work. And Judy does that really explicitly with every work, you know, things being in lower case, but also the additional information that you're adding to them. And I think that's another kind of trigger or something that's instructive in terms of drawing people's attention to what they might be looking at and could, could learn more about. So it's the work, but it's also the artwork label, which inevitably lots of people do take a good look at uh, in that experience. Um, I, th I think I've, uh, similarly to you, I think it's um, sometimes it can be a prompt for people. I often find people, if they're encountering my work overseas, they'll be like, oh, wow, I didn't know anything about this. And that will be a prompt for them to go away and, and do some research and learn. Um, but as Judy said, I think it's, um, it can be really valuable to have that aesthetic function where the, the surfaces of the work and the beauty of the work can actually draw people in to wanting to, wanting to engage, yeah. I just think that artists can lift the lid on things too and hopefully that swarm of information or you know sort of disparity or whatever it is will infect people but we can't we can't sort of know that that's going to happen for sure I think it's like everything people have to be open to it or some sometimes be tricked into it to then um, accept what what stories might be about and maybe they're not ready. Who knows? Yeah. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, actually, when you watch as a when you pretend to be a regular punter in these shows. That you know, looking at Judy's works that were at the Palais de Tokyo in in Paris, and you know, you you, you pretend you're just wandering around looking at the artworks, but you're really listening in on on what people are kind of grappling with or what they're doing. And 
and observing how long they might stop and look at works and that. I love doing that, um, trying to pretend, you know, that I'm not staring at people. But, um, you know, it's really interesting, you know, it is the works themselves draw people in. Um, then they're curious enough um, to, to read the labels. But it was interesting um, seeing Richard Bell's work at Documenta. Um, he has no labellings on his at all. And his, his idea is that, well, if people are curious enough, they will ask about it and they will engage with the, um, you know, the, the workers there about it. But, you know, it's a gamble that you take. But, you know, the work itself is, you know, it draws people in and, and, you know, hopefully you can capture, even if it's, you know, uh, half who will then, you know, have that ripple effect on to say, go and look at this show or go and look at this work or, or look at this artist. So... Yeah, you kind of hope that ripple effect kind of takes hold at some point, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. I think, I think this is probably more for Helen, but a bit maybe Judy has some reflections on this too. Um, as an artist working to decolonise your practice, if I can make that assumption about your process, um, how is it different working alongside... Judy on a project and any reflections on what you might have learnt? Yeah, um, good question, big important question. Um, I, I mean, I, whenever I address colonial realities in my work, I um, am very particular and give a lot of thought to what it's appropriate for me to address and for me that is the way that we as a colonial society construct ourselves rather than um, you know the the injustices and violences that we've brought upon indigenous people in those stories um, but it's also like if you make that decision then there's this you know space where those stories go that you know it's not for me to address them but I think that having the voices of indigenous and non-indigenous artists alongside one another addressing their their own parts of that story I think can be a way to to approach that and a way to to address that um, that imbalance and I think it's yeah it's a really delicate and difficult thing to navigate um, and something you, that you always have to be um, on the ball about and questioning yourself about and not not feeling like you've resolved it but um, yeah I guess that's that would be my answer is having those voices alongside one another Uh, I just want to address an assumption that um, people have made that being an Aboriginal artist is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> and it's absolutely not because not only do you have to negotiate amongst yourselves, amongst your contemporaries, amongst your families, preconceptions, you know, the rest of the world, the assimilated world, etc. Um, there's all of these restrictions that we have and are constantly laid on us, like now, I call it state of origin. Well, you're not from there. <laughs> Why, uh, you know, you shouldn't make work about that. But, for example, I, was, I wasn't born on my country. I was born in a different place. I was born in uh, Mundubbera in sort of, you know, central coastal Queensland. My country's up in the, the Gulf of Carpentaria, northern area. I make work about that, but I don't live there. I don't have a stake on that and I'll probably get told off, not that I know of, but I might about things there. And so I think it's one of those things where you have to think about what is appropriate, but whatever you do as an Aboriginal artist, it will never be correct. <laughs> You're going to get slapped down, so get used to it. And um, you do, try to do the best you can and you try and um, do what's appropriate and responsible, but I think there's a maybe a bit of nodding going on from, you can see Tina here, we've all been through it and it's just something you have to be aware of. I used to call it the black lash. 
um, but I can't, I don't anymore because Black Lash is this fantastic organisation in Brisbane of Indigenous artists and writers and, and workers, but it's like the internal um, lash that you get. So whatever, you know, the sort of non-Aboriginal people can throw it as a, at us, it's nothing compared to what we get from our own and you have to um, survive it as an artist and yeah, it's tough, but it's it's a process you go through and I think you come out, wrung out, but also um, sometimes making better work for it. It's, it's a hard one too because you're navigating that all the time yeah. with, um, there's a lot of trauma um, that's, that's still out in the communities and a lot of shame in telling those stories. Um, but also, you, you know, I mean, you know, that, that's just a snippet of, of, of what we know and what we get told. Um, but, you know, having those personal stories like Judy has, you know, of, her, of your great-great-grandmother's, you know, um, survival of a massacre that's in, in one of the works, you know. Telling those personal stories really, really helps, um, you know, navigate through those, those, those avenues. Um, and, you know, if it's coming from, from a place of, you know, um, of genuine, you know, storytelling, then that's all you can really do. But, yeah, we, we are doubly... Um, yeah, um, you know, held to account for, for what we do, whether it's as a curator or as an artist. Um, and you continually, like, you know, with particularly, say, the, the, the subjects that, that Judy covers, you know, where you've got historians and, and others that are continually criticising and questioning. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough road, but, you know, I think the works speak for themselves and, and they're, a, they're a lasting legacy, you know, really. They're just, they're there. Um, for the record, and, and that's the beauty of, of what artists do. So, um, yeah. Um, Helen and I were talking about that too, and talking about working with history and with colonisation, etc. And it's like, why should we have to carry the burden? Why don't you carry it as well? And so, to all of you, I think, share that responsibility around, you know, do the hard work, and um, nobody gets away with it, so you might as well all get involved and. <laughs> Yeah, do your work. I think that's a great thing to end on. Nobody gets away with it. So um, please put your hands together and thank Helen and Judy. Um, can, I, can I just add one very short Absolute. um, thing at the end, which is that this project was commissioned by the Balnaves Foundation, which was the work of Neil Balnaves, and he very sadly passed away just as this exhibition opened at the NGA. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge his support and the, yeah, the sadness of him not being able to see the outcome of it. Great, thank you.